to join because I'm not seeing him yet here. And uh, so both Alvaro and Osama, I'm not seeing them on the screen. So uh, I was I propose to wait an extra minutes and then to start. Uh, my apologies for this. Uh, I'm not seeing. I yes, I, now I can see on the screen that the session is already uh, live streaming. Excellent. So while we wait for uh, Osama to join and also Alvaro, so the, let's just inform the technical assistance that we have two extra panelists that should join and have not joined yet. Osama uh, Manzar and Alvaro Justin that have not uh, connected yet, but I think we can already start with uh, uh, this year Internet Commons for so without further ado let me start good morning to everyone and apologies for the slight delayed uh, my name is Luca Belli I'm professor here at FGV Law School where I uh, head the Center for Technology and Society at FGV I have also the pleasure of being one of the co-founders of this Internet Commons Forum uh, that now is at its fourth iteration, together with uh, my friend Adam Burns and Henriette and many other friends from APC and beyond. So the goal actually of uh, this uh, this yearly edition of the Internet Commons Forum is precisely to bring into the discussion uh, some perspectives that we felt were missing from the traditional IGF discussions and that could be uh, very impactful for the progress of internet governance discussions and indeed uh, and I think we will speak about this with Henriette in, the, in her introduction uh, discussions on digital commons have become over the past couple of years very uh, important at the UN level including with the ongoing of efforts on the uh, global digital compact so uh, we are we have decided to use a classic format for this this uh, session that we have used already last year so we will have two segments with some presentations followed by question and answers we will start with an introduction by Henriette and to before Henriette sorry we will we still have a, you will you will have to bear me and and uh, uh, Adam for a couple of introductory remarks just to contextualize and so that everyone is on the same page uh, with regard to what we are trying to achieve here and why we are here. So the uh, main reason why we are here, as I was mentioning before, is that we have felt over the past years that digital commons or internet commons or commons discussions in general were a little bit absent from the IGF community. And so we have decided to bring them uh, inside the IGF community with a little bit of provocation, creating an internet commons forum uh, to, let's say, mimic, but uh, in a, a fun, hopefully, way, of course, trying to contribute to the discussion, the internet governance forum with the internet commons forum. And the, the great uh, problem that we have to face here is that this absence from IGF discussions on discussions on, on commons and digital commons reflects a uh, absence uh, of this discussion about this alternative, this third way of governance, the commons governance, that uh, is basically visible in uh, mainstream policy and politics. Uh, and that is a, a pity because we have seen over the past uh, decades that actually the commons is a very interesting alternative solution that complements uh, classic conception of governance based on state and markets, uh, but to some extent also challenges this classic way of organizing resources and society. Uh, and a good, very good uh, uh, example is provided with regard to digital matters is provided by community networks, an issue on which 
I had the pleasure to work a lot with a lot of friends here from the IGF over the past uh, 10 years almost. And again, uh, if we think about community networks, it's crowdsourced infrastructure, uh, shared design managed as a commons, right? So it's a very good example of how commons, digital commons, can, can actually not only exist, but thrive, be sustainable, allow people, previously unconnected, disconnected people to, to, to connect, to create new services, new content, to empower communities and to self-determine communities, to enjoy self-determination or, or network self-determination, as I like to call it, to be protagonists of the evolution of technology, to choose how to use technology, right? So it is uh, really important to, 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 really to set the scene, to understand that what the great difference from traditional management and, and governance system is that the community is at the center of the model, right? It, it is not possible to uh, separate community for the resource that is managed because the great difference between the commons and the other uh, models or systems of governance is that the commons requires the community to understand and care about the, in the shared interest the shared resource that is managed, which sometimes cannot be economically quantified. Uh, if we think about the value of a forest or a, a thriving ecosystem, uh, a, 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 a secure, common security, or the internet, a diverse and open internet, those are uh, all shared resources that are very difficult to quantify, to meter economically. And per perhaps that is the reason why uh, this kind of system is ignored by traditional uh, mainstream economics or, or uh, governance uh, studies. But actually, although it, is, it has been marginalized, is extremely relevant and can function. Again, the classic example that we bring into the discussion is uh, Eleanor Ostrom that won a Nobel Prize studying the commons and stressing that actually his commons can be very useful, thriving, sustainable, as long as there are shared principles, rules, and also enforcement mechanism to make sure that people respect shared rules to manage the common resources. And this is precisely what we are trying to discuss here with bringing to discussion several very good examples, brilliant initiatives and people that are working in digital commons. So without further ado, I would like to uh, now give the floor to my friend Adam and then uh, get into the the, the, the lively part of the discussion with the introduction of Henriette. Please, Adam, the floor is yours. I think you're muted. Adam, I think you're muted. Ah, oh, yeah, so I, I would like to ask the technical assistance to unmute Adam Barnes so that he can speak, please. Luca, Henriette here. I have to leave. Do you mind if I make my remarks before Adam? Because I have a session starting at five. Oh, no problem. So, uh, please, go, Henriette, go ahead. My Sorry, apologies, please. Adam. No problem. Um, I, I, we, we are really grateful that you can have time to be with us today. So, please, go ahead. It's a bit challenging to know where to stand in this room. Um, well, thank you. My name is Anred Esterhuisen. I'm um, from South Africa. I'm very happy to see you all at an African IGF. I am the past chair of the MAG and I'm associated with the Association for Progressive Communications, um, one of the organizations that started convening this. So it's really good to see you all here. Um, Luca asked me to say uh, a little bit about the Global Digital Compact. So I'll, I'll make a few remarks about that because I think we just talked, uh, you know, we just heard Luca talk about the value or the need for shared principles. And um, when we're looking at the commons and when we, 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 we're thinking of the internet as a commons, and I think in many ways we're only just starting this conversation of looking at the internet as a commons, but I think in many ways it's actually a conversation that's not a new one, because I think the roots of the internet is very much in looking at it as a commons. And the Global Digital Compact, which you'll all hear a lot about this week, um, a process initiated by the UN Secretary General, facilitated by the tech envoy of the SG, um, is opening up an open process, getting input from, from the broader multi-stakeholder um, internet governance community and lots of other communities 
to come up with some kind of shared principles that would then um, theoretically be negotiated and agreed on um, by member states um, at the Global Summit of the Future in 2024. They're not intended to be binding instruments. They really are just intended to take us a little bit closer to having a common framework for thinking about the internet, developing the internet, and the digital sphere more broadly, because the Global Digital Compact takes on a much broader scope than just the internet. But I think for those of us that are concerned about the internet as a public good, about public interest perspectives or a commons perspective um, on the internet, it's an opportunity actually to, to look at capturing those principles. And I think the one thing we should try to not do of the Global Digital Compact is to put too much detail into it, um, to make it um, a huge big treaty with lots of different provisions. It really is an opportunity for us to pause, to reset, and to consider what the principles are that, that, that really matter to us in the digital space. And particularly principles that can help us as a global and multi-stakeholder community um, come up with policy and regulation and other practices that, that are not harmonized in a legalistic manner, but that are harmonized at the level of, of broad-based agreement um, at the level of values and principles. Um, but so just my own, my own remarks here, which, which I really am so grateful that Luca and Adam keep organizing this and, and everyone who participates in it. My perspective on this, and I think the Association for Progressive Communications is interested in, in exploring it, this, is how can we actually use the concept of the commons or the concept of the public good and maybe think um, about both, take elements from both. They come from slightly different places, actually very different places, but use them as a way of almost resetting how we think about internet governance. Um, as Luca pointed out, there are tensions around market-based appro approaches to, to regulating, organizing, and developing the internet. There are tensions um, linked to state-based approaches. Um, and there are also real risks. You know, for many years, we've taken the open internet for granted. We now know we can't take it for granted. There are encroachments from state interventions, internet shutdowns, fragmentation, or national, um, you know, setting national boundaries. And there are encroachments coming from the corporate sector um, in terms of violation of human rights, um, the monetization of harmful use, and increasingly, the internet seems a place that we have to intervene in. I think the European Union, the European Commission, has taken the leadership in, in attempting to deal with some of, or some of these challenges through regulatory responses. And we also see the challenges related to regulatory responses. So really, um, I think that's just my, my message here. I think that there's a wealth of thinking when it comes to, to the commons that I think we can draw on um, um, when we reset and rethink how we approach internet governance. It's multi-stakeholder. I think that's the other thing about a commons approach. It is multi-stakeholder, it is inclusive, and it is, it is global. Um, so look, I think that would be my last remark. I think um, what else that I want to stress, um, perhaps just um, the, you know, the idea that, that if we really want to overcome this period of, I think we're in a little bit of a limbo at the moment where, where there's a broad-based recognition that there's a need for intervention of some kind. There's a need for, for intervention at the market regulation level. There's a, there's a need for intervention at self and co-regulation, content regulation. Um, but that we approach this in a very open way, looking at what we value most about the internet, its openness, its, its inclusiveness, its character, as a commons and as a platform that can grow the information commons and other forms of commons, um, but also look at taking lessons from other sectors. You know, we've just had the case of Twitter, for example. Um, is there a way perhaps we can take good practice from market regulation, where you have mergers and acquisitions in the public sector that have to be vetted or reviewed from the perspective of what the impact of that merger and acquisition will be on the public interest. So that's, that's the, sort of my other takeaway. You know, let's be open-minded. Let's look at practices from the commons, from community-based 
approaches from, from the, the world of the market, of market regulation, where it works, where it protects the public interest, and also from our own multi-stakeholder practice and, um, and uh, you know, all, the, all the, the tools and processes that we've created within the IGF space. Back to you, Luca, and I'm sorry that I can't stay. Thank you very much, Henriette. Actually, that, what, what you mentioned is, is fantastic. And uh, I mean, I think that the Twitter example is paradoxically a, a, a very good example of what is usually called uh, with a very wrong definition, the tragedy of the commons. Because uh, like classic economists think that when you have commons, then it leads to failure because of overexploitation by people. But actually what has been demonstrated is that the, the, the failure is because of the lack of regulation, so lack of norms that then leads to abusive behaviors. And that, I think the Twitter uh, example is a very good example of a potentially public good, a public sphere where people can interact that is purchased by one single individual that then starts to do whatever the hell he wants with no limitations because there is no shared uh, governance system impeding him or whomever, I mean, whatever other billionaire uh, doing this. So that is, it's very useful to have to bring this example into discussion. And please, I would like now to give the floor to, to Adam for his initial remarks, and then we can really get into what uh, it promises to be an interesting and very lively discussion. Please, Adam, the floor is yours. Yes, we would like to ask the technical assistance to enable Adam Burns' video as well. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Hopefully that will come on. Watch it. It's going to help. Anyway, um, Henrietta, as always, has brought up uh, some um, central concerns over the disparate nature of uh, centralized uh, uh, internet governance as we have it and, and the role of Commons as the internet has grown. And uh, uh, seeing as we're running a bit late, um, I would like to introduce, first of all, our first speaker straight away. Um, Osama Manza is a founded, founding and dire founder director of the Digital Empowerment Foundation, um, empowering more than 30 million. Senior Akosha Fellow, British Chevening Scholar, and IVLP Fellow, and he's served on many boards of uh, international organizations working in the area of digital development and especially on um, issues of the commons. As I think he's joined us before in one of the Internet Commons sessions. Um, I still do not have video enabled, uh, and uh, so without further ado, perhaps um, Osama can be a bit more successful with both audio and video. Host, could you please um, enable Osama Manza in both audio and video? So we would like to request technical assistance to enable Mr. Osama Manzar audio and video. Thank you very much. Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Am I audible? You are audible, but no video signal yet. Yeah, I am trying to push the button, but uh, the iPad is saying you are not allowed, you are disabled. <laughs> identical to my issue earlier, Osama. Yeah, that's the that's the first challenge to Internet Commons, I guess. Yes, now I think I think I'm online now. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam, and thanks, uh, Luca. Uh, it's always brilliant to be here. 
um, I was expecting to join uh, speaking a little later half, but thank you very much for pushing me to uh, come forward. Uh, 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 as, a, as a starting comment, I would uh, um, uh, I would very much like to echo what uh, you know Andrew had said earlier uh, about the uh, preciseness of our message and also you know voicing it for digital compact and bringing all the voices together. In fact, I was in New York just about a couple of weeks back and I met uh, the envoy of technology on technology and. Uh, 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 we are actually decided to work together to bring in the uh, voices not heard and uh, you know uh, and, and I would like to bring in the concern of the voices not heard on this platform which is very important when we are talking about internet commons um, uh, uh, there is something called right to information right to food right to connectivity but do we have access you know after giving rights we take away the access or we do not give the access and uh, if we talk about internet commons it's extremely important to know that uh, just by making internet available is this really available and accessible to me if i am living as a tribal person not speaking the language that the world understands and, uh, and, and, and I live in a place where not even electricity comes, not road comes, uh, nothing comes. And you still make a policy that actually requires me to give my biometric authentication to get my ration or to get my education or to get my uh, withdrawal of money and so on and so forth. So, uh, so the journey of internet and internet commons in the last 25, 30 years is that while we claim that we have connected half the world, uh, we are still making internet uncommon to the rest of the half of the world and difficult and af not affordable and not available in my natural language, in my natural medium in my natural ecosystem and uh, how do we how do we get that how do we do that how can we make not my language internet enabled but can we make internet language enabled or by medium enabled the medium that i like the medium that i can avail the medium that i am comfortable with the medium that i can afford and the uh, and so on and so forth uh, and and uh, working in indian subcontinent uh, uh, as you know, we have this privilege to have hundreds of languages, hundreds of culture, hundreds of regions, all kind of from coastal to geographic challenges of hills and Himalayas and all that. We somehow have an ecosystem of the remoteness of the geography and the you know affordability challenges as well. And therefore, I would say taking example of India, but for the whole global world, is the people who are not connected yet are the people are the most desirable are the people who are the most challenging in terms of affordability in terms of accessibility in terms of uh, affordability and and how can we actually bring in a principles uh, under internet commons to help to go to digital uh, compact discussions or to go to un discussions and to go to various international policies uh, of various countries that how how can we make this most important infrastructural uh, you know necessity a most commonly available most easily available and most uh, you know affordably available and uh, i don't have to uh, really uh, stress that how, what kind of examples we have we all know that you know, if you go through the statistical data, which language is the highest on the internet, which what kind of people highest on the internet, what kind of people highest uh, and well connected. But having said that, uh, uh, on this platform, we would like to challenge ourselves to take responsibility to bring in internet commons principle to the doorstep of the people who are not connected. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Osama, and uh, that's a very good way to start connecting the dots and also with a little bit of uh, well-deserved criticism. Uh, I mean, it's very, it's essential what the point that you are making that uh, while we, we claim that we have half of the world uh, connected, but actually that is the, the, the easiest half, uh, the most uh, homogeneous and easy to connect half, then uh, it's much harder to connect the rest. And it will be even more hard if we uh, do not think that the rest uh, that is not connected yet has also uh, characteristics, specificities that need to be uh, not only respected, but also preserved and cannot be uh, eradicated uh, simply because it is more convenient or cheaper to use existing strategies that, uh, of course, have limits, right? Uh, to speak about this, actually, there is. it's very good to have as next speaker uh, Nicolas Echanitz, our very good friend uh, that also has been contributing over the past years in community network discussions, uh, not only uh, with regard to uh, uh, how community networks work, but really to create, uh, we can call them uh, digital goods, digital common goods, uh, new platforms, hard, new hardware and software, open source hardware and software that has enabled really literally thousands of people to, to have access to the internet, to have connectivity, to produce, to create new content services and culture. Please, Nicolas, the floor is yours, and I would like to ask the technical assistance to enable his audio as well. Thank you. Hello. Ah, yeah, I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Luca. Um, I was thinking about a few points. Um, at Altermundi, we work in, in the development of technology, of open source technology, both hardware and software. And we are usually confronted uh, with the standard way of doing uh, software, hardware, uh, internet uh, deployment, etc. And to us, it's interesting that um, the internet, which was like ideally born as a commons, is uh, is now in a state where commons is not the common ground. No, it's not uh, the standard. It's like, for example, when you receive your autonomous system number and your IP blocks, uh, you negotiate your BGP border with a network, for example, in our case, with the National University of Cordoba. And, but then we are blocked upstream. Our autonomous system number is blocked upstream. And there is no uh, technical issue here. It's just an administrative issue, and it's a, a big fish decision. No? Like the, the big fish here uh, in this example is the state operator, the ARSAT network, which decides that it will not route traffic coming from autonomous system numbers that are behind the system numbers they are connecting unless you ask for it specifically and you are convincing. It's like, it's not granted. And this is completely broken. Like the internet is broken when you do this. And to us, this is a, a, a perfect example of how the internet works nowadays. It's mostly concentrated by big operators uh, the biggest ones are private, and then we have, in some places, we have important uh, state actors. But even the state networks still take the decisions based on, on market observation and on market rules. 
Um, and for us, this is this is really strange. It's like I go to talk with the state and I say, well, if you can provide us with uh, transport over your fiber network, which means that we won't cross your network towards another network. No? Transport is just over your network. Uh, so th this doesn't have an external cost. It's just using um, capacity that is there, that is unused, and we, a commons-based uh, initiative, are asking you, the state, who have the mandate, who has the mandate to bring communication and relevant access to every citizen to just share a resource for which you have no cost, yes? And I even uh, like write the, the, the contract to do this uh, legally, like uh, it's all there, you know what we will do, what we won't do, uh, all the specifications, we can add whatever you need. And usually they start by saying, this, this is quite logical, this makes sense, but then it gets stranded somewhere in bureaucracy. Yeah? It's like, it's impossible. We at least haven't been able to convince a state operator being that a national or a regional operator about the convenience of sharing the network with community networks. And the convenience is both ways because um, community networks would very much profit from having uh, access to a big uh, fiber network in the region because they could interconnect different community networks in different small villages and exchange uh, content, culture, etc. But also they could uh, share whatever um, international transit agreements they have, like for example, we have an agreement with the University, uh, National University of Cordoba, where Altermundi uses all the, the bandwidth that is not being used by the university, and it is shared with a number, about 12 community networks. Yes, if we could use the state uh, fiber network, we could bring this, um, this bandwidth to many, many more community networks that are not accessible to us because of the distance, but that could connect to the state fiber network. And the university bandwidth is like very big in, in comparison to what community networks need. So all the resources are there, like the university wants to share international transit, the communities need it, the state provider has the network to interconnect all of this, and no one has to lose a penny, and nobody will be uh, earning a penny over this. It is just bringing connectivity. But still, they won't understand it because they don't think about the internet from an, a commons perspe perspective. And so we are working with this uh, very specifically. We think it's needed for the state operators to understand this concept. And even here in Argentina, where we have been very successful with programs from the uh, regulator regarding funding for community networks using the universal service fund money, uh, even uh, we still are not able to convince the state operator to work from this um, frame of mind when it, uh, it uh, regards to the transport over the network. And another small issue, do I have a couple more minutes, Luca? Or? Yep. And another issue that is uh, to us very important regarding the commons, um, 
is devices and technology. What are the end users using to access culture nowadays? We have cornered to the use of mobile devices, which uh, are not always connected to uh, a power outlet, which are to a metered network, which we cannot just use, it is metered, limited uh, storage, and we have a limited uh, capacity. And all of this, which is uh, what most of the people uses to connect to the network, creates a network of uh, consumers, of consumer and users. When you need to store your own family photographs, instead of storing them on your own devices, you will store it uh, miles away, hundreds of thousands of miles away in the uh, quote-unquote cloud. Uh, we believe that we need to push back. We need to push back regarding what's the technology that we use to connect to the internet. Because otherwise, we are limited by both the hardware and software and services that are provided uh, as uh, a mass product. Uh, and we are cornered in this, uh, in this um, idea that we are only consumers and we cannot produce and we cannot provide content from our device. Uh, so we believe that we need also to work a lot on this front. Uh, we, we are developing software already for uh, some years calling, uh, called El Reo, El, uh, the repository, the cultural repository, which is a distributed repository of culture. And we are working on this matter, like how do we um, add an additional device to uh, mobile devices so that families can share a sort of local cloud where they can store their own uh, culture, their own uh, productions, their own content, and then share through the phone, but owning what is there first, instead of uh, giving it for free to corporations uh, to make money and manipulate the public opinion. Okay, so I think uh, that's it for now. Thank you very much, Nicholas. It's great to hear you talk again, always inspiring, um, especially as you seem to compliment uh, uh, many of the topics Henrietta said. As we have scaled, the, the, the governance in the commons perspective seems to have broken down from, from corporate and regional and state access. It's down to just practical every day from the technical administration of trying to connect your local network to the greater internet to issues over the corporatization of uh, uh, our own personal data and indeed our regional culture. So I think you wrapped up so many layers of uh, the commons as a stack, so to speak, in, in your presentation. And I wanted to thank you uh, for that. And uh, it also touches, I think, on some of um, Osama's points, and that is you know, the lack of autonomy and uh, you know, even after access that we have uh, as individuals or, or regions. So it really does seem to me that this year's topic of internet as a commons to start thinking about tackling the issues of uh, the tremendous growth and importance and economic uh, rise of the internet itself and, and the players that now dominate this space and all the layers from platforms to infrastructure to data pools themselves and clouds. We, we, we need to, to look at ways in which this uh, larger stack really can be uh, governed in, in a way more compatible aesthetics and of course you know very well um, there are many people like yourself Nico who haven't given up hope yet um, and most of them are emerging from the edges other community networks that are um, also joining 
and especially uh, people such as um, Ramon Rocco, which we see met in Spain, whose governance model as they roll out infrastructure is based on confidence principles. And uh, you, um, Nico and Ramon and many other people are inspiring uh, many groups globally to take some of that back. Um, I would like to, uh, just before I introduce the uh, next speaker, I would just like to check whether uh, Jane Coffin is actually uh, present um, at this session. Luca, would you have uh, any knowledge of that? Uh, yeah, unfortunately Jane is not able to connect now because she's in transit and maybe we can take advantage of her absence to have a quick uh, 10 minutes uh, slot of questions from the from the audience and participants uh, in uh, in Addis Abeba. I have seen that there is already uh, some interesting question in the chat, so maybe we can take one just to uh, break a little bit between this first slot and the next one. I've seen that there is an interesting one by uh, Sivas Branian uh, on uh, the question of uh, ownership of platforms uh, and uh, so and also open source community. So what uh, Siva is asking what safeguards are thought uh, of or to prevent the governance What is important is not only to have principles and norms, but also effective enforcement mechanisms that make sure that people respect those principles and uh, to avoid uh, examples of failure like a badly managed public trust that Siva was mentioned. Uh, so I, I would like to open the floor maybe for just a couple of reactions or questions from uh, the participants. I don't know if anyone has uh, a mic in the room, but I guess so. So if there is any uh, reactions from the, uh, about this from the uh, from the people in Addis Ababa. We are very happy to hear you. Otherwise, we may ask uh, Nicholas or uh, or uh, uh, Osama. Do we have any thoughts on this? Do we have any reactions from the floor from the from Addis Ababa? If you want to. Yes. To, 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 yes. If you want to, to yes. provide any comments, please just state who you are, uh, because uh, I'm not sure everyone can see you. So, all, all, for for the records, it's good to have your name and, and affiliation. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I'm uh, Dr. Mohamed uh, Yassin from the University of Lille in France, and uh, I just want to uh, Mohamed Yassin is not uh, the. This uh, thing of uh, automatic writing is not an uh, efficient one because sometimes it, is, it writes something different than what is said. So I recommend you not to rely too much on it. Uh, that is, this is one observation, technical observation. Uh, Luca, you mentioned that uh, Twitter uh, is owned by one person and is dictating what he's doing on the global uh, users of uh, internet and so on so like uh, you what is your suggestion in this case uh, to avoid this somebody uh, or corporations uh, control and dictate what they are uh, uh, doing on the people how can the commons uh, uh, the suggested common overcome such a problem is there any possibility that people uh, or users migrate from such a big platforms when they are not uh, fully satisfying them? Uh, is there any mechanism to avoid such uh, behavior? Thank you very much. Uh, 
expected to me. I, I, I will abuse my position as a moderator to, to, to reply. I think that uh, what you are raise, uh, what you are raising, Mohammed, is there are two deeply intertwined uh, aspects here. On the one hand, the fact that simply because uh, one is uh, backed by considerable financial capacity and we have seen uh, i mean elon musk the richest man in the world that easily raising 50 billion uh, dollars to purchase uh, and make private a, pre a previously publicly traded uh, company and which also means that uh, it, ma it makes it totally opaque because all the transparency obligation that the publicly uh, traded corporation needs to comply with in terms of transparency what you are planning to do, how do are you, you are using your money, uh, why are you fighting people and uh, how are you planning to, uh, to, to be accountable to build the public, they have disappeared, right? Uh, that is uh, something extremely, in my perspective, extremely uh, uh, negative for uh, if, you, if you consider the health, not only of the internet, but of the uh, specific uh, platform. This could be actually avoided either to prohibit this takeover by a single man of a uh, entire uh, platform that is so essential for public debate uh, nowadays and on the other hand maybe easier and more advisable on my from my perspective to make such platforms interoperable so to invest to, to define how those platforms could be interoperable i mean you know if you're if you one day someone purchases your uh, email provider, you can download your emails and upload them to a different email provider that offers you better conditions. And you will keep on being able to exchange messages, uh, videos, whatever you want with other uh, people through email because email is interoperable. And that is how the internet was born, right? Through interoperability. So I think that one of the key elements of uh, that we need to, to focus on in order and we have also a session about this uh, on interoperability and all internet openness on, on Thursday for those who are who are uh, interested but why are the key elements that uh, one has to focus on one of the key principles that one has to focus on is indeed interoperability and creating also a mechanism that allow to this not to be only uh, uh, empty words a nice label interoperability as even some some uh, regulation does, uh, if we take for a very trivial example, but the, the, the very uh, praised GDPR, the, 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 EU, uh, the EU General Data Protection Regulation, creates a right to data portability. So everyone has, every data subject has the right to export their personal data and import them to a, competi to, to a competitor. But de facto, this is impossible because there is no, there are no defined in, uh, standards of interoperability on how to do that. So it's uh, even when the, the the regulation aims at being very refined, uh, de facto is a failure. So I think that uh, one of the main issues probably as we have this discussion on internet commons is how to create standards that enact that allow interoperability, competition, and digital commons to flourish and not to be uh, uh, taken over. Uh, at will by billionaires, because I don't think that this is the kind of internet, it is uh, for sure not the original internet philosophy, and I think it is not the kind of internet most of us would like to, 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 to live in or to communicate. Sorry if I'm speaking too much, I would like to take uh, other reactions. Uh, for, I, I see that Nicholas has one, please Nicholas, go ahead. Because I think we can hear you, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, I just wanted to comment that uh, the, you, you bringing the email example is interesting because email was like uh, the last standardized service. And it was, uh, and it still is, uh, 
the one thing that is standard in communication. But um, I think it's interesting what happened with um, instant messaging um, with the XMPP protocol, which was, was the standard and actually is the base technology for both WhatsApp, uh, Google Messenger, and many of those um, technologies that are now uh, private technologies that have voluntarily broken the standard so that it won't interoperate with other uh, instant messaging platforms. If you remember, uh, it was possible to install um, free software uh, for XMPP instant messaging communication and still be able to communicate with people on Google Messenger, for example, for a long time. But uh, then this this was broken, and it, and the, the um, to me the most important thing about this uh, service being broken, for one, it's what is um, transporting most of the communication of the people nowadays, right? Uh, WhatsApp, instant messages in general, and uh, not being standardized and not being open source, um, you have things like, for example, WhatsApp uh, is now encrypted. It has been encrypted, encrypted for many years. But we do not have access to the code uh, of the client or the server. So, for example, if our communications are encrypted, not just with the keys from the receiver and uh, the emitter of the communication, but also encrypted with a general key, which is owned by the company. Uh, we can know this. It's possible to know this. But according to, I would say, statistics, uh, it's impossible to conceive that they are not encrypting your communication with a key they can then use to decrypt communication. So what this makes is a global, uh, a gro global theater where the only government with access to most of the communication data in the world is the United States because they have a legal system where, where they can force any company to disclose all information and to make it secretly. And it's a treason if the company um, denounces that they have been asked to uh, disclose private communication. So to me, all the blocks are there. I would say I know my communication is being monitored by only the US government and this creates a uh, disbalance in, in communication where other governments are uh, not just us as, as, as users and private um, users of the internet, but whole countries, whole governments have an opaque technology using to communicate and a uh, foreign country has access to the communication content. This is, I think, like one of the most extreme examples of how bad uh, it is to not have the internet governed as a commons and to have standards enforced uh, on uh, corporations. All right, I think we can get uh, into the next segment of the, the uh, discussion with the presentation from uh, Will Radrick from Grassroot Economics in Kenya. Uh, so, uh, Will, can, uh, can you hear us well? Let me try to, if I can unmute you, I have to find you here. Will Radrick, yes. 
Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes, very well. We can hear you and see you. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. 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 Um, I'm going to try to share a screen. Let's see if I can. No, I can't share a screen. Um, I'll just talk. Maybe someone can allow me to share a screen later. Um, I, I guess the what I have to talk about is a little bit different. Um, I've been working a lot with David John Johnson um, from South Africa on the Ineti system, um, but specifically working on economic commons around um, mesh networks and um, trying to create incentives and, and uh, essentially credit systems in local communities uh, to be able to pay for um, the usage of this, these mesh networks. Um, and the way that looks is essentially that the, the operators of the mesh network that are run, running these antennas from their houses and keeping them on and whatnot, they create a voucher redeemable for the services of the network. And uh, on the Ineti system, what we have is a whole bunch of offline content like Nextcloud and Wikipedia and uh, Khan Academy, and also the abil ab ability for people to upload their own content. Um, and so if you can imagine this group of people that are providing this mesh network, um, they create a bunch of vouchers. So it's a mutual credit, similar to like a mall voucher. Um, we've used a, a blockchain to do this, to have you know a decentralized ledger as well that's also held on the network. Um, and so these vouchers are um, sold uh, in for cash, but they're also very much sold in kind uh, into the community. So when people want to get access to this mesh network, which also has a, uh, a backhaul as well uh, of actual internet that they get from local providers, um, people have to have these vouchers. And those vouchers give them basically metered access. I mean, there's a there's a free layer that you don't need any vouchers for, and that's like the the, the local content. And then there is a, um, a cost for getting the backhaul of the internet. So what happens is that these these tokens or these subscriptions, if you will, right, these are subscriptions to the, the internet, end up flowing around the community and acting as kind of a local currency in a way. In a way. So people will end up accepting them for tomatoes, for instance. So you can pay for internet with your tomatoes or your eggs or whatnot. And so someone who ha who pays with eggs for this voucher can also spend them on other stuff in the community and whoever needs internet can now redeem them for internet access, right? And so for instance, one voucher gives you something like three hours of internet. Um, that's, it's not three hours from the time, it's three hours of usage. So we actually track them actually, you know, uh, being active on the network. Um, and something like three vouchers ends up being a day uh, worth of internet. And that's, uh, you know, roughly four times cheaper than um, the alternative through, you know, Safaricom or the, you know, the major telecoms. So we can offer very, very, very cheap uh, distributed internet services. And we can also offer like a freemium level or a free intranet mesh network services as well. And all the trade of these vouchers ends up creating secondary circulation and trade, right? So like the, the internet ends up becoming a basis for a local economy as well, right? It's the backing of last resort for trade for tomatoes and, and all kinds of stuff within, within the community. So that's what we've been working on here in Kenya. That's where I'm based. And then also in, in South Africa, in, uh, in Ocean View. Um, so I think there's there's an interesting kind of concept around economic commons and looking at, you know, these subscription models and who's offering services and uh, these promises against services being um, in some ways an opening to a different type of a commons um, that's, that's backed by a redemption as payment in local services. Um, we've also done the same kind of economic models without internet, but with other types of backing goods and services. So for instance, you know, maize mills, uh, uh, business networks coming together, things like coconuts and coconut oil acting as a backing for a, a local voucher economy. So I don't know if you've, if you've heard of like a airtime credit in Kenya, 
with Safaricom, you can also Sambaza or trade that airtime credit, right? So that airtime credit is a promise against the services of the telecom, right? Which is also tradable and people will use it as a currency as well within the country. And that was actually the predecessor for M-Pesa here. So in this case, we have a, a mall voucher, a promise against the services of the mesh network. So as people now buy these vouchers, um, those vouchers end up getting redistributed back to the node operators, you know, of the network that are running the antennas. Um, so yeah, let me let me pause there. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Will. And it's really excellent to see actually this, this um, al alternative uh, local. Uh, economic system that your initiative is triggering and how this actually is not only uh, including people uh, in a digital ecosystem but also creating a new new local uh, economic ecosystem so it's really uh, demonstrating the the benefits of connectivity both as a driver of inclusion but also driver of empowerment and also creation of value at the local level for the local communities, right? Uh, now, uh, I would like now to, to invite our next speaker, uh, Laureen Van Breen from Wikirate. Uh, she is based in Netherlands, uh, can be opened to uh, make corporate uh, corporations more accountable so uh, please uh, uh, Laureen the floor is yours so I would like to ask our technical assistance to uh, yeah unmute Wikirate. Laureen can you hear us yes this is okay. great can we yeah. also see can we see you can we uh, also uh, uh, activate Laureen's camera. Yes, I think. Wonderful. Here Fantastic. I am. <laughs> we can see you. Fantastic. Welcome, Laureen. Magic. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for having me today. And uh, yeah, for uh, sticking with us. It's a lot of uh, technical uh, content, and I'll try to, um, yeah, also uh, share some details with you, but not go too deep into the material. Um, as you heard, I'm going to talk a little bit about a different commons than what you've heard so far, which is the data commons. Um, and I thought I would start by grounding ourselves. It might be repeating the obvious, but uh, what really is a commons? So a commons is a land or a resource that is belonging to uh, or affecting the whole of a community. And I think there, particularly what I'd like to pick up on is the belonging to part, um, because that is from a data perspective for a data commons is what from our perspective means it must be open data that we're talking about. It means access for everyone. Um, it means a shared responsibility and it brings in the notions of ownership and governance. And that is something that is quite important. Um, and today I'm going to dive deeper into yeah, what it really is it, the case when it comes to the private sector and the public sector data. So data about companies. Um, and this is exactly where ownership and governance creates an interesting dynamic. It complicates things. And um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, but maybe just to give us a bit of an overview of where we're coming from, from and where are we now and where are we headed, right? So um, a data commons that is probably most of you will know is Wikipedia, which came about at the turn of the millennium. Um, the first edit was made in 2001 and in the 90s was really the first proposals were starting to be created for this free open encyclopedia on the internet. Now about a decade later is when Wikirate came about. Um, so we started in 2013 and really the idea was that there's a lot of information out there about companies when it comes to their financial performance, but we know very little about them when it comes to their sustainable performance. So the environmental and social dimensions of their impacts and their actions. Um, now the information is out there, but it's incredibly hard to get an overview. There's not one place you can go to. There's not one site where there is an aggregate. And if there is, you have these huge paywalls to get through. And so 
it, even though the information is out in the public domain, the public doesn't really have access. And our mandate was to make this a public resource once again by bringing it together in one place, cleaning it, standardizing it, and giving that access for free to everyone. Um, so this is one of the, the, the big things that we were trying to change. Um, and really, our role as an organization that sits behind all of this is to develop the infrastructure. It's to create tools and to support the community in their use of this platform, right? And the community is the people. It's the whole of the community, right? Anyone who's interested in this information can help collect the information, they can analyze the information, they can use the information, they can extract it. Um, so it's all of this activities and it's driven by what the community is interested in. Um, now, the way we gather information, so how do we bring it into our data system? Um, there's three ways. As much as we can, we automate, right? So we are integrating with other data systems. It's that interoperability piece. Um, now, of course, as we just heard, standards, there's not one standard for that. So there's a lot of work that comes into always working with these different groups and setting it up in a way where you can really share information between your systems. Now, then you get into the semi-automated techniques, right, of scraping and bulk importing data sets into a, a platform like ours, and then allowing anyone to access that again. Um, and the last element there is why we are wiki. It's all of this information is stuck in PDF reports that are incredibly hard to process with machines. And so we're bringing together the community around these sources and asking them, can you help us extract the particular information that we're looking for in these documents. And that is really the wiki element as well. So not only is the community able to access and use and analyze this information, they're actually also the entry point for us. They're helping us uh, gather all of that information. And this is really important because it really is the basis of why we would never be able to sell our data. We cannot sell data that was gathered by a community. It is not ours. And so it laid the foundation for us that of course we had to be a commons, right? Not only can we say we are a free resource, we have to be a commons. Um, and this is really um, also then brought into the question of, okay, well, but there's there's so many sources out there, right? We're, we're collecting data on companies. The overwhelming majority of information is coming from companies themselves. But if a company tells me they're sustainable, is that really the only source I wanna check? <laughs> if I do a job interview, I have references that get checked. I can tell you I'm a nice person. That doesn't mean much, right? You wanna check with others. And the same goes for the performance of a company. So we are collecting data, not only from what companies are telling us about their actions and their impacts, but also collecting data from worker, workers, right? So working with NGOs on the ground, bringing in perspectives. Not only do we want to see, for instance, what the commitments are of brands on supply chain wages, but what are the actual wages being paid in factories? Um, and there's a, a project uh, that I'd be happy to share in the chat as well that really does exactly that. So we're comparing that gap between what companies are telling us and what is the, the, the reality on the ground in terms of supply chain wages. Um, and it's that triangulation piece that really shows the power of a commons. Um, because workers were traditionally not a group that was associated with ESG data, this environmental sustainability data, right? It's, it's a group that didn't have access to the information, didn't have a way to provide information. And this is really what we're trying to switch around and say, well, if you're impacted by companies, then surely you should have a voice in this space that is driving decision-making on whether uh, the world is going in a sustainable direction or not. It's not just investors who know best. And so this is really what, uh, what we are working toward. Can we actually bring this information into the hands of those most impacted by companies as well? Now, and so we, as I already mentioned, there is no way that we would ever sell data. Um, and this is so important to us that it's part of our statutes. It's, it's when we founded the organization, that was the basis of what we said we were going to do. Um, so that's one way to protect that commons, that approach. Um, but we also really have 
uh, different systems in place in terms of governance. So we're actually doing updates to our governance as well uh, in the coming months, where we're bringing community members onto our board uh, and making sure that they can also govern the, the organization that's behind everything, right? That is maintaining this infrastructure and that's providing this access to the information. So there's also that element to it. So that gives you a little bit of background about Wikirate's journey. Um, but while we were going through all of these steps, um, the, we, we weren't the only ones that caught on to the data commons um, arise, really. Um, so in 2018, um, just to highlight a few big ones, in 2018, Google's initiative, uh, the datacommons.org, um, where they're aggregating a wide range of sources um, from the public uh, that they're, they're trying to make more easily accessible, um, then you had in 2019 the EU that had a directive on open data and making it easier to reuse public sector information. Um, just earlier this year, we had uh, also the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive in the EU, um, where they also embedded this question of like, okay, it needs to be open data and there needs to be this European single access point where anyone can access this information and extract it. Um, and we also had earlier this year the announcement from Macron, from the French government and Bloomberg together saying they will create an open data repository for climate action data. So we're really starting to see large political um, players and large uh, private sector players taking a stance on open data um, and wanting to yeah, test the waters. Can they get involved? Can they help this movement? Um, but when you dive into the practicalities of all these initiatives, that's really when it becomes clear that these players, um, companies, governments, uh, this shared ownership, this idea that data belongs to the community as a whole is something that they're struggling with. Um, it is not something that it comes intuitive for them. It's, it's actually counterintuitive. It's a mindset shift. And this is actually uh, what we're seeing in how they in the practical uh, practicalities of it. So what steps are they actually taking? What legal frameworks are they using to create these initiatives? Um, and so you start to see, for instance, nonprofits that are data portals that become privatized um, and that become a social business or business with purpose. Um, you see uh, complicated business models popping up where, for instance, they are charging for the infrastructure so the use of an API rather than the data itself, um, which of course can work sometimes really well, but then you start to compete as an access point. And do you understand what that means then? Um, and another thing that we're seeing is that certain stakeholders are completely forgotten. So you're, for instance, with the, the Bloomberg initiative, you're starting from a perspective of, we serve the financial sector and it's going to be open data. Well, if it's open data, there's also other stakeholders to consider. And are you considering them as use cases? Are you making it easy for them to access that information? Do they have a say in how your service is going to be provided? What data you are providing, right? So these are the kinds of things that we're starting to see that they're still struggling with. So while our advocacy focuses on just helping people understand what is open data. You know, if it's public, that doesn't just mean it's open data. There's a licensing that comes with that and lots of other things. Um, but uh, also helping them understand what practicalities, what practical steps do you need to take um, to really ensure that you're going toward a data common system rather than just making a few tweaks and saying that something that previously you would hoard and sell now is free for everyone, right? Um, and so I would say the path is slightly messy and chaotic, but the rise of the data commons is undeniable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorena. I, I think there are re three main points that uh, uh, are very emerging as very clear and very important from your, from your talk. Uh, and first, it's the, the need to involve the community that is affected by the commons in this case, the people that, for instance, also work in the corporations, but also that have an impact on how the, the, the infrastructure, the data commons, then it is utilized. So the, the indissociability of the people, the human elements from the commons. And then the, the fact that the, these kind of initiatives may very well and actually very frequently end up uh, uh, 
uh, privatize. And again, my point about Twitter before was precisely, I mean, I don't want to argue that Twitter before being purchased by Elon Musk, Twitter was a commons, but the fact that it is possible, feasible, and even easy for, to some, for some people to uh, purchase an entire, uh, in a, 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 an organization or a structure that previously was managed in the common, uh, uh, in the common uh, interest. And again, I don't want to associate this with how uh, Twitter was managed before, but the fact that this privatization of the commons is feasible uh, may be something on which we want to think and, and discuss. And then the last point is that also in some cases, this becomes a necessity because again, it is if you do not have from the very beginning a framework, a governance framework that considers the sustainability of the commons as a key priority. I mean, of course, as anything, uh, the management needs entails costs. And so it's also an interesting and necessary to discuss, uh, to discuss also the financial sustainability of the commons as a point that if faced, tackled from the very beginning, then leads to the sustainability of the commons. Now, uh, I would like now to open the floor for our second segment of discussion. I don't see our last speaker, Alvaro, unless he, has, he is connected with a pseudonym. I don't, uh, in this case, I would like him to uh, manifest himself in the chat. Otherwise, I don't see him, right? So I think Adam, I can pass, I can pass you the, the floor so that you uh, open for the, uh, our final segment of Q&A. So please, Adam, the floor is yours. Yeah, hi. Um, I assume Alvera isn't in the uh, in the audience in the, in the uh, remote uh, participant. Um, but yeah, we've heard uh, a lot, and thank you, Laureen, for for your input into uh, the space of data commons. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's very uh, uh, interesting that, and, that more and more data and there was commons no are, are opening up, as you say, not only in uh, not only in um, public spheres, but also concerning corporate activities uh, within the, the public spheres, opening up to perhaps no, I mean, more transparency in and, the schedule, uh, accountability, which is certainly part of um, a healthy governance of a commons. Um, yes, so um, I'd like to open uh, up okay. to the floor of the of the uh, uh, venue in Addis Ababa to ask whether we have any uh, questions or open discussion points uh, um, in, in the room. Huh? Uh, so, uh, no, no, I want to speak to the microphone uh, in the session. People, uh, but there is no on the ground can, can please uh, help in relaying uh, the questions on, with uh, the microphone, etc. I, I, I can't just start talking over them. Yeah. And when you have comments or questions, please identify yourself uh, and in case the captioning doesn't work properly as uh, highlighted before you can even correct the, the, the captioning with uh, restating your name. So yes, I guess we have some comments and questions from the floor. Yes, uh, my name is Raul Plummer. Um, hi, Luca and Nicholas. Um, I think Nigel uh, already asked uh, an interesting question that do we want to regulate this on the UN sure. level? Uh, really? The, 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 it, it, it looks like the, the, the mic on the floor is muted. So let me... Well, it's on here. For um, us to unmute IGF, the host. Can you get me? Yes, in? now oh. I can hear you. Now ah, can okay. Hear you. Thank you very much. So, uh, Nigel touched on a, on a uh, nice point in the chat. Um, uh, something that should we be uh, regulating um, this on the level of the United Nations? Um, and I think, uh, well, that sort of uh, spurred me to think of, of a question that's been, and what Nicholas was saying about the, the transit of the information and the data uh, between the networks. Um, and my question is, um, is there any push uh, for, regulate, for regulation that would actually give a margin of the communications uh, from the ISP networks 
to this Commons um, initiative, because I think there should be like it, it, the officials have a, a share like that uh, is is sort of uh, reserved for the official use, uh, and I think there there could be a, a margin for the for the Commons use as well, uh, instead of just like basically reserving uh, bandwidth uh, for not for profit and community networks data streams. So, is there any push for this kind of regulation? I think there should be. Well, let's let's see if there is any reaction to this comment. Nicholas, you should be unmuted. Okay. Um, um, hello, Raul. <laughs> uh, well, we we are trying to push for this. It's not uh, easy, really, because it's not easy for them to understand, for the state to understand what we're asking for, because it's usually the commons is not the framework they come from. So you have to explain like, uh, for example, here in Argentina, we have an interesting um, point because uh, as you know, in, I think it's, it was in 2013 that the media law was approved here in Argentina. Um, this law, one of the things that it uh, stated was that um, spectrum, radio spectrum, should be divided in three. One for the one third for the public sector, one third for the for profit sector, and one third for the non profit sector. And this was related to radio and TV frequencies. And um, it did not address internet bandwidth. But I think that is a very interesting uh, point to raise. Like if, if that made sense, why doesn't it make sense to reserve uh, bandwidth in state networks for community data packets. I think it, it makes uh, complete sense. Yeah, thanks, uh, Nick. Um, raised my hand and I think uh, Osama has as well, but just to uh, use co-host privileges. Um, I think there is uh, a comment there about uh, how can the, say, the, the UN or such other bodies uh, govern such things? It's, it's really complex at scale, I'm not sure, but I think there can be a feedback mechanism. We have all these uh, growing demands from groups at the ed edges, community networks, uh, people interested in particular data commons and so on, but, but the centralized governing uh, uh, structures for this um, are not equipped, they're not uh, enabled, uh, they don't have the tools enabled to, to carry the conversation bi-directionally. I think it very much is, is something of scale and of scope of data. But Osama, you had uh, your hand up there, perhaps you've got a comment to make. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I was trying to unmute. So two people together unmuting is like muting yourself. Uh, so <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, no, so I had a, I had one uh, interesting uh, uh, intervention is that, uh, you know, uh, internet access is pretty much top down. All over the world, it has been done by telecom, right? which is 90% of them are private agencies and in several countries, government. 
it is pretty much like creating a highway or a road making. But can we liberalize internet access totally from the responsibility of telecom altogether? For anybody can build their own internet, can build their own, uh, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that it won't connect to the internet. Just that if I have privately or civil society or collective have money, I can build my road if you are not building my road. Similarly, I can build my own uh, mall or a shopping mall. I could build my own market and bazaar and I can also build my own internet. And liberalizing this will actually enable people to create the network and then it will be a matter of you know interconnecting with other network or other kind of uh, things so there is this collectivization will become uh, liberalized and will translate into building my own uh, uh, data infrastructure or digital infrastructure or internet infrastructure community network is pretty much like that but it is also seen as a subset of internet but what i am saying is that can it be liberalized can there be a policy of creating uh, connectivity as a bottom-up approach for the rest of the world which is supposed to be connected with where the affordability is a big issue because telecom won't connect if it is, it is not afford it, it not doesn't make business sense for them right and and therefore it is important and I, I i directed the example of several community networks that's what they are doing but are they becoming policy what are the things that can make them policy you know what kind of so liberalization is one side itself will give them an open hand to build your own network you know so we don't have to work like community radio right so liberalizing the uh, the whole uh, requirement of licensing itself should be should be something should be, should be deleted from the law book you know like uh, you know you don't need to uh, you know first you deliberalize and then therefore you don't need a separate license to connect because then I'm automatically liable to uh, build my own network, uh, use my own network to have like the, like the way we have private colonies, like the way we have, you know, secluded colonies and so on and so forth. And, and, and therefore, uh, the, the document that I shared on the chat that G20 endorsed the community network as an alternative digital infrastructure or digital transformation a model can be one of the things that we can use it as a, as a, as a, as an excuse. And the second thing is that forget about internet or uh, digital infrastructure. There are many commons that is available all over the world, the way community lives. So what are those models that can be applied to create a digital colonies or a digital models of connectivity, you know, like Auroville in India, Auroville has their own, uh, mechanism of payment system, connectivity system internally, irrespective of whether the internet was there or not. Uh, similarly, there are many, many in Scotland, there are many, many comments like that. There are many, uh, you know, I'm sure in Brazil, there are many, there are many communities who live with their own uh, laws and rules and regulations and very happily and uh, with a with lot of uh, liberalism, with a lot of, you know, common principles can we adopt those principles and apply it to digital connectivity and internet connectivity and 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 and, and share with each other to see how uh, internet commons can be created uh, with uh, its own localization thank you i just wanted to chip in and also make a comment because I, i've seen it in the chat there has been a, a comment i think by nigel uh, Hicks saying, "If we want uh, the UN to be the forum that that uh, regulates, that that at least that that organizes and leads regulation in these quite uh, sensitive issues, and of course, uh, while we are in a UN summit in this moment, we all recognize that there are limits to the UN and that the, the pace of." policy elaboration in the UN is absolutely not the same pace as the evolution of technology, of course, but there is there is a great but here, uh, which is the alternative? Which alter, which better alternative do we have? Uh, I honestly, uh, I, I understand very, I sympathize very much with all the criticism, uh, really, I, I'm not saying this just for politeness, but I really sympathize very much with all the simp uh, criticism towards the UN is a, uh, not the most agile organization in the world, of course, 
but we have to uh, recognize also there has been some increasing openness, including to discuss this type of issues. And I also think we deserve some credit to have brought this issue uh, in the, uh, into IGF discussions, not only with the Internet Commons Forum, but a lot with community networks discussions over the past years. And it is leading to fruits. I mean, on, with all due respect for the very well-deserved criticism for the uh, UN, uh, only some weeks ago at the ITU uh, planning potentiary, there was an adoption of the resolution that gives instructions to the uh, ITU development bureau to support sharing uh, experiences and information on alternative uh, and complementary access networks. So this means in de facto that all the efforts of all the people that have been working for community networks over the past decades, and especially within the IGF and on the UN level over the past seven, eight years, as we have been doing, are leading to some fruits. Of course, it, the, things do not happen magically overnight. And of course, the UN has very, uh, pardon me for being so blunt, but very lethargic times sometimes. But I, I don't see, and I, I open this as a, as a, as a uh, open questions, maybe also for Nigel or for others in the room. Uh, what other fora uh, that may, may be more suitable to the elaboration of shared rules and even shared principles that advocates for for uh, a different and a, a complementary approach, this commons based approach uh, that could be that can be can have on one hand the same relevance, the same impact, uh, but also the same authority that the UN can have. So if you have any other suggestions, I'm really very I would very be very happy to to, to hear them. And with this provocation, I think we could have continue uh, having the uh, debate. Okay. Yes, there is. I think there is some already some replies from the floor. Please. <laughs> Well, good, good afternoon. Perhaps I could just just briefly, very briefly say something. Uh, Nigel Hickson, uh, UK uh, government. F first of all, thank you very much for this session. I, I, I think it touches on extremely important issues uh, because as, as we've heard from contributors and uh, also on data of of course, as well. The, these, these issues are, are of importance to everyone. So I'm certainly not trivialising the importance of this panel and the people you brought together. And I'm certainly not criticising the UN <laughs> at all. Uh, it, it's not my role. Or, and uh, I, uh, this UN IGF is something that certainly the UK government passionately believes in, and I passionately believe in. You know, I was at the World Summit on the Information Society in 2003 uh, when we first started discussing this. So the point I, I think I was trying to make was really in, in relation to technical standards. And, you know, there had been a discussion about how we, you know, how we can ensure this interoperability and this interconnectivity and, and how everyone can have the uh, appropriate internet experience and I think our, our, our concerns is, is 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 that and we fully uh, I, I think you know what Henriette said earlier is is, is 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 we really positive to have principles to discuss this further and to understand exactly what we mean by internet commons and what we think the principles are behind it but when you get down to the technical issues of of, of standards then I then I think that you know the UN is probably not the best area to negotiate you know technical standards, but clearly at the principal level and at the policy level, and as you rightly said, as pointed to at the ITU plenipotentiary uh, a, a few weeks back, uh, I think we all have a, a, a role to uh, play in this. So thank you. If I may jump in just with a quick response, thank you for that. Um, uh, those those comments, and I really do think it's it's about scale. I think uh, the UN should be probably quite slow because it has a, a larger scale to consider. Um, I think perhaps some of the challenges are um, finding regional governance structures that work for um, 
more fragmented or more federated communities, whether that be in a data forum or whether a regional forum um, geographically, um, to, to help uh, speed this governance process up. And I'm not quite sure uh, where that should lie, whether it should be um, in the um, civil society region, whether it should be in the state. Um, these are questions we still need to really, really understand. Does the multi-stakeholder um, uh, model work as uh, still work with, with with our modern requirements now at the, at a sort of a policy level for guidance and and governance? Um, these are all interesting questions. Um, are there any further uh, responses uh, on the floor or speakers virtually? I have a question. If we had, yes, if you have any questions from the comments, please go ahead and please identify yourself with your affiliation before starting to speak. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah, uh, I just have a, a small comment question. Um, I'm Pau Guinard. I'm from Barcelona. I am at a business school in Esade, and I just recently wrote a paper on the comments. Um, uh, but for a um, business ethics journal. Um, so our me and my colleagues were um, trying to find out which were the ethical aspects of the comments that should be highlighted, um, focusing basically on the traditional comments, the ones studied by Eleanor Ostrom, and, and, and we focused uh, very much on the tragedy of the comments uh, um, uh, that Har Garrett Hardy pointed out in 1968. And then we found out that it doesn't really apply so much to the digital comments as it does to the traditional comments. And we were um, also wondering whether the same definition could be applied to both or whether there should be a different definition for digital comments, especially in terms of extractability and, and, um, uh, uh, and, and how the, com the digital comments can be endlessly extracted, whereas the traditional comments uh, have a limit and therefore uh, they tend to, towards tragedy and uh, the digital comments not so much. I don't know if anyone has the answer to that. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Actually, uh, just briefly, um, Eleanor Ostrom did actually publish uh, at least one uh, publication on digital commons as well as uh, geographical and physical resources. And, I don't, uh, and so I think the, the principles of governance and, and of, of commons-based structures uh, can fit into the digital realm as, as well as the physical just as well. But you make a good point that uh, extractivism and um, the infinite copyability of digital uh, assets are a distinct difference when it comes to the digital commons as opposed to uh, traditional uh, land-based commons, that's true. And we need to, to think more about that in some of the full commons stack. Uh, actually, also, if I may chip in again with a quick comments, uh, I think that what's, what's also very interesting to, to note is that uh, in one of the most uh, renowned formula about commons is the tragedy of the commons. But this is actually uh, a scenario that uh, so that consists in the uh, over exploitation and destruction of the commons by people that as they don't have not having any property rights, they don't know how to manage a resource and they automatically, this automatically leads to over exploitation and destruction. But that is actually not really a, uh, a, a conceptualization of the commons, it's a conceptualization of uh, lack of uh, principles governing a shared resource. So it's uh, quite the antithesis of a commons. Uh, again, as I was trying to, 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 uh, to stress at the very beginning of this session, what is it is really, and I think was very well explained also in the example uh, recounted by Laureen, what is very important to understand in, is the indissociability between the human element and the resource. So the fact that the individuals, the community that organize the common, in the commons model, they understand, they care about the common resource and how this will be uh, managed and even passed through to, to next generations. So the, uh, what uh, is classically considered in a very, with a very appealing uh, for those who really don't like or don't know commons models, the tragedy of the commons is de facto the tragedy of a lack of 
normative and governance framework that can prevent failure. Uh, if we see, for instance, when we have, uh, I, I, I myself, as a Brazilian citizen living in Brazil, I see, I've been witnessing over the past years, uh, enormous deforestation of the Amazon. That is not because people, they, uh, that is not a tragedy of the common, it's the tragedy of oversight of, pe of individuals destroying a common resource. So it's, I think we should be very uh, careful also of how this translates into the, the digital environment. And my point before speaking about the takeover by one individual of Twitter is, I think it goes in the same sense, meaning if we do not have any safeguards uh, that may avoid the takeover of a single individual or entity of something that is very uh, essential for uh, the public good, uh, then that is a problem. The problem is not that the commons tends inevitably, inevitably to tra tragedy. The problem is that the lack of principles, governance mechanism, rules, and enforcement mechanism of those rules that prevent this to happen uh, is precisely what leads to the tragedy, right? Uh, now, uh, do we have any final uh, comments and remarks? Because we, are, we have uh, 10 minutes left, I'm seeing, so it would be good to have uh, uh, also some final comments by the other, uh, the other uh, participants and panelists, and maybe if there is any more from the audience, uh, from the participants in Addis Ababa, uh, do we have, uh, unfortunately we cannot see you through Zoom in this moment, but if there is any comments or questions from, uh, from the floor, uh, please go ahead. We are not hearing anyone, so we assume there is no comment. There's one more. The... Oh, there is one more. Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, again, Muhammad Yasin. Just a question for uh, the wiki rate and all, all the common platform to sustain it itself, uh, how it can finance itself in order to be uh, financially uh, sustainable and guarantee the durability of uh, these digital uh, commons. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much for that question. Um, yeah, so we are a nonprofit and we're fully funded through grants and donations. Um, so uh, you can think of it similar to Wikipedia, for instance. They have a lot of individuals who are giving donations. Um, we might have larger donors or corporate donations or anything like that. Um, but most of it is really coming from foundations at the moment. Um, there's uh, often for these kinds of infrastructure projects, it, also it's public funding is a big uh, kind of supporter. Um, but I think one of the more interesting things for the larger scale commons models that we're talking about, right, is one of the things that the Wikimedia Foundation has done. So they've created a trust pretty much for themselves to sustain their future, right? So they had donations that went into a bigger trust and they are investing that and using that so that they can sustain themselves. So they are no longer just dependent on all of the donations and this kind of uh, fluctuation of support um, uh, so they can manage that and secure themselves in that way. So there are also models that can be um, yeah, ensure independence long term for larger data commons or other types of commons. I hope that answers your question. Do we have any final remarks from the other panelists? I'm checking the, the chat to see if we have forgotten. Uh, yes, there is a point about the interesting of transparency and accountability indeed to successful common management. Yes, and then, yeah, I see that also Desiree Milosevic is agreeing with the fact that uh, there is important lessons uh, about the, the tragedy of the commons or indeed it's tragedy of the lack of regulation and governance that can be applied and must be applied to digital commons. Uh, 
there are actually there is an important point also that I, I would like to include in the discussion that I think uh, was raised in the, by the last interventions, which is that uh, commons uh, again does not mean is not a synonym of free for all. Uh, it, 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 so the sustainability of the commons precisely also includes uh, debating how. Uh, the commons can be financed and funded. Uh, last year, we published a very interesting uh, booklet that was presented at the IGF on the uh, sustainable models, funding models for community networks, exploring how this actually has been put into practice and how the, the various funding models that these digital commons that uh, Nicholas was uh, very eloquently uh, mentioning are funded. And Wikipedia, again, is also a very uh, recurrent example of, of how this could also scale at a global level, uh, again, thanks to uh, donations, thanks to uh, to uh, a variety of uh, funding models. I mean, for those of us like me, for instance, that uh, use Signal, Signal is a very good example of an open source uh, common. It's a, it's a, 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 a instant messaging uh, platform that I, it most, I mean, millions of people use on a daily basis, both for private and work interactions, based on donations that works exceedingly well. So it's, it doesn't mean that a common is not necessarily uh, a, a small uh, park or garden uh, managed by a, uh, a dozen of neighbors that clean it and, uh, and paint uh, uh, the benches uh, after uh, once every two years could be something digital, could be something that uh, both at the infrastructure, at the hardware or software level can play out and can be something very successful and scalable. Now, I think that the, 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 as uh, the, uh, the, the speaker from the floor from the University of Barcelona was mentioning, uh, probably one of the, the, the greatest problems we have is the lack of knowledge uh, and the very, the remarkably few literature that has been dedicated to this and how this could be uh, could play out in practice. Again, thanks to Einar Ostrom and the, mainly the fact that he won, she won a, a Nobel Prize with her uh, investigations on the commons. We have, we know how relevant it is and how serious the debate is, but there is still a remarkable lack of uh, knowledge and research in, in, in the translation of this knowledge and research into policy proposals, that is probably the greatest, the greatest obstacle that we have. And I think that one of the uh, outcomes of this uh, discussion of today that is now tending to, towards an end is precisely that maybe the, the need for the community that has been gathering over the past four years, this Internet Commons Forum community, to try to provide some concrete suggestions and maybe feed them to the digital, uh, the global digital compact discussion that Elriette was mentioning at the very beginning. So try to translate the research, the experiences that have been described uh, over the past four years here and more, of course, uh, into policy suggestions that could be used, uh, maybe could and can be potentially uh, uh, become scalable. Uh, and again, as I was mentioning before, the UN, I mean, you may criti we may criticize it, but I'm not sure, sure there is an, any other viable uh, sort of alternative that may allow us to, to have this kind of debate in a meaningful way. And again, as the very recent plenipotentiary conference of the ITU uh, demonstrates, it may take some years, but then some interesting and meaningful and actionable result, even in terms of policy, uh, can happen. Uh, so I would like to see if there is any other final comment. Otherwise, I will give the floor. In any case, I will give the floor by, by my, to my good friend Adam uh, for his final wrap up. Okay. Uh, thank you, Luca. Unless there are other participants, I don't see any hands up. Um, Yes, I'd, I'd like to make the observation that uh, the governance of the Commons, of course, doesn't stop with uh, Eleanor Ostrom. It's going to be an ongoing process. And even, uh, as I said before, uh, Eleanor did edit a, a book on uh, Commons applied to the digital realm, but it's really seen as a very early uh, attempt at, at um, structuring the, the, the digital Commons governance 
um, structure in the same way as the physical uh, commons. And I think we have had um, other uh, people who have influenced this, not to mention one of the most famous, um, Aaron Schwartz has done a lot of uh, work in, and public uh, 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 inspiration in terms of uh, digital data commons over opening up to access of information. And there continues to be uh, a vibrant community uh, network or a, a network of community networks globally that are looking at such issues along the whole stack of, of information from uh, services that uh, Nico, Nico meant to data spaces that Laureen meant, uh, mentioned, and of course infrastructure that Nico also mentioned. All these issues um, in terms of accessibility uh, has has become more and more difficult. Uh, Osama mentioned that that uh, internet access uh, has has been uh, wonderfully successful uh, in terms of increasing uh, some proportion of uh, human accessibility. But of course, accessibility is not the only issue in terms of just connectivity. It's accessibility in in a lot of uh, other uh, other levels of this of this self-same stack. And it's grappling this uh, together with what I also still see as is vital uh, of scope of size in how uh, these commons governance can work uh, and effectively. Just again, repeating that, you know, the UN might be seen as a slow body, but then perhaps it has to be in terms of being able to listen to uh, comments and demands gave, given on it, given its global scope. Again, small regional or sectorial uh, groups might be able to have a voice within uh, new structures that we form, I believe, in part uh, voiced by people at the edges, such as community networks and uh, specific sectoral groups that are interested in, um, in uh, the, the the sharing of data, uh, uh, the sharing of commons across the full stack. Final words, Luca. Thank you very much, uh, Adam. Thank you very much to all the friends, uh, old and new friends that joined us for this uh, Internet Commons Forum 2022. It has been a real pleasure to uh, discuss with you and uh, of course as usual you will find the recordings of the session on uh, www.intcomforum.org our website and let's uh, keep in touch to try to con convey the, the outcomes of today's discussion and of the past years of discussion on digital commons uh, at the UN level so that this can really have a meaningful impact. Thank you very much and have an excellent IGF. Ciao, ciao.